Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again, where we are finally talking about Timothy Dalton's duology. Now, I've had something of an interesting experience. Oh, oh, please, don't mind me. I'm from the Bond fan police. Uh, please, continue. Sorry, uh, who are you? I'm from the Bond fan police. Um, I, I'm sure it's nothing to be worried about. We've just had reports of relatively middling opinions on this channel about Timothy Dalton's finest hour as James Bond, so I'm just here to observe. Uh, yeah, please, pretend that I'm not here. Oh, right, um... Well, okay then. Uh, well, as I was saying, I've had something of an interesting relationship with Timothy Dalton's pair of Bond films. I mean, when I was a kid, he was certainly my least favourite of the Bonds, but that has somewhat changed over time. No matter what you think of The View to a Kill, and I'm a bigger fan of it than most, there is undeniably a tired feeling to elements of it, and obviously overuse of stunt doubles reflect the fact that the character was losing some believability as a big screen hero. I love Roger Moore to bits, he's my favourite Bond, but the series was definitely in need of a bit of a refresh, and who better to start in the living daylights than the man pretty much destined to be Bond, someone who could take the series in exciting new directions. Yes, I'm of course talking about Pierce Brosnan. The Bond produced has signed Brosnan on to play the part in 1986, and even went so far as to take a few promotional picks with the actor before, well, as everyone knows these days, Brosnan's TV contract for further episodes of Remington Steel was renewed at the last minute, and as such, Cubby Broccoli proclaimed, Remington Steel will not be James Bond, and it was back to the roulette wheel of candidates. Ladies and gentlemen of the world press, it is my absolute honour and privilege today to share with you the name of the actor who will play James Bond, who was of course our first choice to replace Roger Moore, and this actor's name is... Sam ne uh, Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton, our first choice. Timothy Dalton was our first choice to replace Roger Moore. He was our first choice. It's the first choice. Much is made of the fact that Dalton was even considered for the role back in the 1960s for On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and this is all well and good, but when you look at the details, you do kind of get the sense that it was a bit of a scramble to get him cast and on set for this film, and this could literally have been any number of other actors. I mean, if the dates hadn't lined up the way that they did, we could have had Sam Neill, Robert Bathurst, or even Mel Gibson as 007. And I'm not sure any of those actors would have brought the starkness of contrast with uh, Roger Moore as much as Timothy Dalton did. I mean, even when it comes to interviews promoting their films, talking about the films, the uh, difference between the pair could not be more obvious. I think the essential quality of James Bond is that he's a man who lives on the edge. You never know, he never knows when at any moment he might be killed. Uh, therefore, I think some of the qualities we associate uh, with Bond the qualities we've seen in this series of movies, uh, the qualities that Ian Fleming wrote so well about, uh, reflect that sense of danger. You look at the script, I uh, very little to say, which is why I yell and gate, my name is Bond. I mean, it's written, my name is James Bond, so I say, my name is Bond, James Bond. You can call me James. In preparation for this role, I lived in a casino for 20 days and smoked 350,000 cigarettes. I spent most of my days pulling pranks on the crew and clocked off at lunch. Dalton's more serious approach to the character will be music to many a Bond fan's ears after more than a decade of the film series taking a very loose approach to adapting its source material. As Ian Fleming's James Bond in Moonraker, you say. Huh, maybe there's another Ian Fleming Bond author out there because I don't see the similarities. I know that The Living Daylights is considered something of a classic these days, but honestly, it's not one that that I turn to all that much, I'm someone who prefers Dalton's second Bond license to kill much more, and The Living Daylights has always felt like more of a bridge to get to that darker, more mature tone that Dalton's performance can really flourish in, I think. For the purpose of this review, I'm revisiting the film for the first time in years, so my main goal out of this is to kind of see whether it holds up better for me, or whether those long gestating opinions of mehness still hold water. And obviously it goes without saying that the opinions presented in this review are purely my own personal, like, this is how I feel about this film, this is how I think when I'm watching it, and I know that it has an, a huge amount of love and a great fan following, and I certainly don't want my own Bond fan card revoked as a result of maybe not liking this film as much as some others. And just before we dive right in, please do consider clicking the subscribe button if you have not already subscribed to this channel. You can also click the Mrs. Bell notification button if you want to stay super up to date on future video uploads. And with all that being said, this is an in-depth look at The Living Daylights. The film begins with our first glimpse at the new Bond in a new gun barrel sequence before opening up on the Rock of Gibraltar where the film's pre-credits action sequence takes place. M briefs a trio of agents that they're on a training mission, but the assignment is hijacked by a mysterious assailant with a penchant for labels. 
examples, specifically ones stating smeat spionum. Do you want to put that in English for those of us who don't speak spy? Or death to spies for us Christmas Joneses out there. It's a really cool opening few minutes with these agents and makes for a cool guessing game to start off the film. Which of these guys is going to be the new Bond? I mean, it's probably going to be the one who's on the poster, but who knows? The first real shot of Dalton, not including the gun barrel, of course, is incredible. And the whole action sequence that follows is a terrific way to introduce a new actor to the part. The quality of the filmmaking as a whole just feels a huge leap above from A View to a Kill. I mean, for a starters, the dummies that they use for characters falling to their deaths are much improved. But more than just that, obviously the fact that we actually see the actor himself getting involved with the physical stunts is really cool and helps achieve a level of believability to the action. And don't get me wrong, stunt people perform astronomically difficult stuff um, on film sets, and I certainly am not advocating that you know, lead actors do all of their own stunts, but I think that when there is the right combination of both and a level of sophistication to the filmmaking, it can be almost seamless and you just get lost in the action, which is lovely. And this is obviously in a stark contrast with something like A View to a Kill, where I'm pretty sure that Roger's stunt doubles have more screen time than he does. Here in the living daylights, though, it's almost seamless, so I can just get lost in the action and in the spectacle, which is which is lovely. However, it's clear that the series isn't taking a completely stylistic break. There are still some Roger-era type gags here with bemused civilian onlookers and cuts to animals, but one can only imagine the levels of restraint taken in the editing room to not have any of these monkeys do a single double take. As far as Bond introductions go though, I think that this is one of the strongest. It's a cool action sequence with some great stunts, Dalton looks terrific, and he doesn't even say a word until around the seven minute mark where he lands on the private yacht of a woman with the most first world problems imaginable. It's all so boring here, Margo. There's nothing but playboys and tennis pros. Maybe if you'd been paying attention to what was going on around you, you'd have seen a vehicle careen off the side of a mountain and explode about 20 meters away from your current location. One would wonders how engaging the conversation with Margot was to distract this lady from the fiery cacophony taking place in her immediate vicinity. <gasps> no, he didn't. <gasps> what did he say? <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, Margot, you're gonna have to speak up. Yeah, I don't know, it's birds or something. Anyway, it can't have been that great because she immediately decides it better to sleep with Bond than call Marco back after Bond commandeers the phone to report into MI6. This leads us into the credit sequence and title song by Aha. I really like the song and the credits are well done. It's Maurice Binder's work, so it's always just a delight to see this guy's stuff on the screen. If I'm left wanting anything at all from this sequence in particular, though, I guess I would have appreciated a bit more iconography present in the sequence that made it feel specific to this film more. I mean, yeah, there's girls, there's guns, there's water, but some of my favourite title sequences in the series are ones where you can't imagine them at the front of any other Bond film, like Live and Let Die, for instance. But hey, it's beautiful all the same, and I'm happy we have it here. And now we're off to Bratislava to experience about 12 minutes or so of absolute 007 heaven. Bond meets with his contact Saunders, played by Thomas Wheatley, and the mission quickly becomes apparent. The agents are there to assist in the East to West defection of a general Georgi Koskov, played by Jeroen Krabbe. This sequence is lifted almost straight from the Ian Fleming short story that the film shares its title with, and it works as an impressive recalibration of the cinematic character for the new actor. Dalton is absolutely perfect here. He just wonderfully conveys a spy out to do his duty. There are some amusing moments with Saunders, and there's great chemistry between the two actors. Dalton shines real bright, real quick here. He has a Connery like panther gait to his strength and I just adore the moment where he reconfigures his dinner jacket into stealth gear. He looks so at ease here. While Saunders and Bond await Koskov, a sniper appears, who happens to be the same cello player that Bond was admiring in the orchestra earlier, Kara Milovi, played by Mariam Darbo. Bond deliberately obstructs, but doesn't kill Kara, much to the chagrin of Saunders' bloodlust. Shooter, what are you waiting for? You missed. Deliberately. Seeing someone's brains shot out of their head was the only thing I was looking forward to today. How this sequence teases little plot details that'll become relevant later on is just excellent too. Bond raising an eyebrow at the fact that Koskov specifically requested him for this assignment. It sets up a great bit of mystery as to why the girl with the cello would go on to be a sniper. It's a really strong sequence and that continues into Koskov's escape via the pipeline and the introduction of Rosika, played by Julie T. Wallace, who is an absolute blast in the small part she plays 
plays, and I also want to give a small shout out to her boss, played by Peter Porteous, who you may recognise from his previous role as Lincoln in Octopussy. I guess after being rumbled in that film, he had to retrain as a gasworks supervisor? Koskov is met by an out in the field Q, who is inexplicably here to just basically point Koskov up a flight of stairs, but it's always a delight to see Desmond Llewellyn in this role, and it does help translate to the audience that, okay, this is all good, Koskov is in safe hands now. My only complaint is that this whole sequence is over much too quickly. I think I'd happily see an entire film with the trio of Bond, Saunders and Rasika on a mission together, and this entire sequence has an undeniable Fleming feel to it, while also featuring some good humour and, again, adding to the new version of the cinematic character that Dalton is bringing to screen. There's a great exchange with Saunders at the end of the scene that really underlines this. I'm reporting to M that you deliberately missed. Your orders were to kill that sniper. Stuff my orders. It's really hard to imagine Roger Moore's Bond saying that same line with that same level of conviction. And if he did have to say it, I'm pretty sure he'd have found a way to make it sound like a double entendre. Back in London, Bond is hanging around Q Branch to try and identify the sniper. The scene also introduces us to the new Money Penny, played by Caroline Bliss. Over the course of her two films, I don't think she has much of a chance to really make an impression, and she's only seen very briefly in both films. The character has been altered a bit as well to become, well, a bit more of a geek, I guess. Anytime you want to drop by and listen to my Barry Manilow collection, It just feels like a bit of a stark contrast to Lois Maxwell, who was always able to convey a bit more savviness to the character. There was a confidence and a self-awareness at play that made the back and forth a bit more spicy, particularly in her scenes with Connery, but I feel like that's lost a bit here. And I'm not sure if it's a conscious creative choice or if it's just what the actress is naturally bringing to what is on the page. Um, I, I guess props to them for trying something different, I just don't think that it works terribly well. However, we do get the Ghetto Blaster, which which is one of the best throwaway Q lab gags ever, before Bond is ordered to head to the safe house where Koskov is being kept. M and the Minister of Defence are present as the defected general explains the reason for his defection. <laughs> general Pushkin, who is General Gogol's replacement, and how many friggin' generals are there gonna be in this film? Koskov says that power has gone to Pushkin's head and that the maniac has decided to target British and American agents to escalate tensions between the East and West. Spiat spionum, death to spies. Koskov suggests assassinating Pushkin Pushkin before this initiative is accelerated further. Hearing this, M suggests that he and the minister leave for London to regroup with superiors, and Bond leaves with them. Personally speaking, if I was Bond, I'd have been pretty annoyed that I was called out to this safe house to literally drive a hamper over there, and knowing how busy Harrods can get, that was no mean feat. Ah, Bond, very good. Well, that's it for today. Back to London we go. Come along, minister. Look lively, 007. We haven't got all day. In and amongst these scenes, we are introduced to the film's primary villainous henchman character, Necros, and I'd argue the most memorable antagonist of the entire film for <coughs> reasons. He's introduced as a mysterious assassin, and we see him kill a local milkman to take his place and gain entry into the safe house, and we're treated to a pretty excellent fight sequence and a bit of action as he kidnaps Koskov. The scene also features an appearance from the most unlikely of Bond recurring stars in Chrome the Parrot, who you may recognise from his role as Max the Parrot in For Your Eyes Only, and just as an aside, this parrot was once owned by Diana Rigg, and on that basis, if any animal deserved a biography, it's this one. Damn parrot had a more notable life than me. This is all really great stuff and it's an incredibly well put together sequence, but I just have one <laughs> little issue with it. Where's 007? Now, I'm very aware that these films traditionally have sequences like this early on, where Bond is absent so we can see a bit of plot taking place. The sinking of the ship in For Your Eyes Only, the hijacking of the shuttle in Moonraker, the assassination of a bunch of people in Live and Let Die, but in this instance I just feel like the scene would have been something really special if Bond, M, and the Minister of Defence had still been in the building when Necros attacked. I mean, with Bond perhaps being put in a position where he had to choose between protecting M and the Minister or saving Koskov, and then that would really have given M a legitimate reason for being mad at Bond later on. Though I can see why they did opt to have Bond leaving the safe house, because ultimately for the story to progress, Necros has to succeed in his mission here, and if Bond was there, Bond would have to fail, at least, for Necros to go off with Koskov. And maybe they were just uneasy about potentially showing Bond failing in 
what would have been his most second action sequence of the film. However, I do feel like the sequence is just missing something. I mean, don't get me wrong, the stunts and choreography are superb and there are some elaborate moves in here. I just have a hard time being invested because I don't really care about the outcome of some butler and stenographer. But I get that the point of it is to showcase the film's main physical villain and move the plot along. And I, you know what, I guess it achieves both of those things. It also has the desired effect of giving the Minister of Defence reasons blow steam out of his ears in anger, which is pretty much a trope of the series at this point. We're the laughing stock of the intelligence community. I've always really loved that line and just the implication that there's a, there's a level of bitchiness to the intelligence community. Oh my god, is that is that Freddie Gray over there in the corner? Oh, can you believe he's showing his face around here? It's ridiculous. Oh, I know, how embarrassing. Poor love, you just have to feel sorry for him though, don't Maybe you? I would if I could stop myself from laughing every time I look at him. Oh, you <laughs> terrible, shut up. Uh, he hello over there. Oh my god, act like you haven't seen him. Shh, look away. Shh. I hope no one saw him talking to us. Oh my god, it is social suicide. <laughs> <laughs> he also treats us to some excellent jowl wiggling, like he's boss Nass from Star Wars or something. <laughs> M is pretty pissed off too, which explains why he's keen to assign Bond the task of terminating General Pushkin as Koskov suggested. Bond isn't so sure though, citing a personal history with Pushkin. Now, I think it's common knowledge at this point that General Pushkin was supposed to be recurring character General Gogol, who had been appearing in the series since The Spy Who Loved Me, but actor Walter Gattel was not well enough to take on such a major role in this film, so things were rewritten to focus on this new character Pushkin, played by John Rhys Davies. Now, I think Pushkin ends up being a great character, but this would have been so much more impactful if it was General Gogol, given his recurring role in the series, his past interactions with Bond, I think we would have been more sold on Bond's reluctance to carry out this assassination. I mean, I think that the setup works as is, I just think it would have had an extra layer of edge to it, I guess, if this could have been General Gogol. Off to Q Branch, one of the best Q-Lab scenes of the series. I love Desmond Llewellyn in this film, and it feels like his character is being pivoted to more wacky inventor uncle type than a perpetually pissed off civil servant that he was during the Roger Moore era. He still has some withering responses to comments from Bond, but there are fun moments, like when he plays a little prank on his co-worker with the sofa, where you, you just get the sense in this one that he's a bloke that actually really loves his job. Bond gets a multi-purpose key ring finder, which is a nifty little gadget, and Moneypenny pops up again with information identifying the cellist sniper, which gives Bond a specific lead to follow when he sets off. If I were him, I'd be pretty concerned with how much time Moneypenny is spending away from her actual desk in this installment. One wonders what trickery she's pulling to have this go unnoticed. Moneypenny, what the devil's going on with these reports? It looks as though you fell asleep on the keyboard. You better start bucking up your ideas. Anyway, at this point in the series, it's kind of novel to have Moneypenny do something that actually has a bearing on the plot again. I mean, locating the cellist sniper and Bond heads off to Bratislava to intercept her. So, I mean, just from a screenwriting 101 kind of perspective, I like that Moneypenny serves a purpose to the story here, even if it is just pointing Bond in his next direction. Particularly in the last few Lois Maxwell turns, the character didn't really have anything to do, and while the flirting with Bond is always sweet to see, and there's no way that I'd want Maxwell cut out of those films, it's not as if she's provided any story-wise assistance since, uh, oof, well, I guess the man with the golden gun when she pointed him in the location of the golden bullet that killed 002. Bond tails Malovi, and after she is apprehended by General Pushkin, ends up with her cello case. He heads to the nearest toilet cubicle for some privacy to check it out and discovers it holds the same sniper rifle that he shot out of her hands while assisting with the defection of Koskov. I love this whole little sequence and Dalton's performance specifically. This is a non-dialogue sequence, and we're just going by his facial reactions to really tell the story and it's all really well conveyed and he really does feel like an actual spy doing actual spy work. I appreciate the little bit of humour that we get too when he takes the case into the public lavatory and he's getting some odd looks and I think it's played well like with this tone. I mean if this were a Roger Moore Bond film the attendant would have had a flask of vodka and his eyes would have been popping out of his head like a Tex Avery cartoon or something but here it's just an amusing subtle little bit and hey remember this guy from the San Francisco sequel? in a view to a kill. That's one well-travelled gent. Oh wait, here he is again sweeping the streets outside Kara's flat. Is he KGB? CIA? What's going on with this guy? He's doing a better job at blending in than Bond is. The next day, Bond follows Kara to her recently KGB-raided home. They're trying to get from her where Koskov is. I think that this is a really well-written scene in terms of conveying story information while contributing to character at the same time, particularly for Kara, seeing her kind of humdrum apartment, and she has these big cow-like brown eyes that just scream naivety and her face lights up like a ten-year-old when she's told that Koskov's alive and well. You saw him? Two days ago. He's safe and sound. You're a 
proper end of this? We've been through quite a lot together. There's something so heartbreaking about that moment, like she's just jumping to conclusions that Koskov is trying to get her out of there and she's just being lied to this whole time and now Bond is coming in and he has to be deceptive in his own way to kind of get her along for this uh, ride and to get the information out of her. But I do quite like that Kara is presented here as a relatively average person, aside from her amazing cello playing abilities, obviously, but otherwise she is kind of living a relatively humdrum existence and now she's about to be whisked off on this incredible adventure. I think Dalton is really great in this too. He knows from the blanks in the rifle that Koskov's defection was fake. I love the little grin on his face when Kara confirms this. He's having to keep up the pretense of being in on it to get Kara on side, but behind his eyes you just know he's like, you son of a bitch, Koskov, it's great. After a fun little bait and switch to get Kara away from the KGB undetected, we get certainly my personal favourite funniest moment of the film. We have about ten minutes, if we're lucky before they discover what's happened. I must get my cello. No way. It's such a great little moment, but obviously the hero's ruse is rumbled, and this prompts the next big action sequence of the film in the Aston Martin as the police pursue the pair. Absolutely love this whole sequence. It's a nice twist that Bond is using all these gadgets while knowingly <laughs> waving away Kara's questions and amazement at what she's seeing. What happened? Salt corrosion. It has some great stunts, the John Barry theme music is terrific, love all the location stuff, it's really well filmed, has a great sense of escalation to it, love these skis coming out of the Aston Martin, hate seeing the thing explode, but it does mean that we get the final part of the chase take place on Kara's cello, which is just all kinds of fun. I don't know if this is considered too silly for some, like, I do have to check myself every once in a while when I say I consider this to be one of the more serious Bond films when we get scenes like this in it, but I think it's a testament to the filmmaking and the performances of the actors that it isn't treated like a comedy set piece, like say the hover gondola was in Moonraker. It just feels natural and it's fun without being silly, and I think it's a perfect capper on the best action sequence in the film for my money. We've nothing to declare! That's the cello. Hello. Hello. Next up we move to Tangier where we see General Pushkin meet with well, I guess he's the film's main villain, uh, Brad Whitaker, played by Joe Don Baker. The Living Daylights are similar to Octopussy in the sense that there are kind of two main villains. I think that you could make a case for either being the main villain in their respective films. Here, because Whitaker is the guy in charge of this little band, he seems to be the one most in power, so I guess my vote is for him when it comes to, like, between him and Koskov? I like the stuff that's written for this character, his war obsession, he has all these wax works of himself as famous war leaders throughout history and obviously sees himself as a bit of a military man, and I like that Pushkin calls him out at one point that he was actually expelled from the army for cheating and has mainly just worked for criminal organizations since. I like that he's pretentious and pompous, I just don't know if Joe Don Baker has the right level of bluster for the part. I kind of wish it was someone more like a George C. Scott or something had been cast in this role. I mean, the character doesn't have that many scenes, and I think you need someone a bit more bombastic in the part to make it a really memorable villain role, kind of similar to how Steven Burkov really made something of that role in Octopussy. I think you needed someone equally as crazy in this part. Though, I, probably I do admit that casting Joe Don Baker in this role does serve the character's uh, pretensions of uh, military status better. I guess if you did cast someone like a George C. Scott in the part, you could believe that George C. Scott would be an actual proper general, whereas looking at Joe Don Baker, you're kind of like, yeah, you you were never officially a general, were you? Anyway, during this scene, Pushkin tells Whitaker that he's cancelling an arms deal between him and the KGB. He knows Whitaker and Koskov are up to something, but he doesn't quite know what, and he wants his money back. Bond and Kara hitchhike their way to Vienna, where we get some character, romantic moments between the pair. I'm pretty sure that I'm on record somewhere on this channel as saying that I don't much care for Dalton's performance during this scene. Um, the level of intensity with which he buys Kara a dress it used to really jar for me. Watching it now though, I think I actually quite like it. I think that Roger Moore would have played this off really casual, but the fact that Dalton is grinning so much at the prospect of charging the dress to Koskov is really funny. Back in Tangier, we get an official confirmation that Koskov is a badden, and he and Necros meet with Whitaker to discuss what it will take to get Bond to assassinate Pushkin, and decide that they need to kill another Western agent to move this plot along so Pushkin doesn't get his money back. Now, this this may not be all that apparent on a first viewing, particularly as any audience member might be distracted by the sight of the poor budgie confined to Necros's swimming trunks. 
What was that? Nothing. But also because there are a lot of characters at play here and there's different levels of deception going on. At this point in time, the characters on screen don't know that Bond knows that Koskov's defection was faked. So I would be fascinated to know, like, if any of you have memories of seeing this for the first time, were you shocked by this reveal? Is it a reveal that Koskov's a baddie? I find it very odd that we never have a proper OMG reveal moment for Koskov. It's all just handled very casually, both Bond discovering that the sniper assassination attempt from earlier on was faked, and the reveal of Koskov hanging out at Tangier Villain Central here. It feels like something that was written as a twist, but the presentation is, well, it's almost like they just expected you to know all along, and hey, maybe they did, because here's the actor talking about the role at the production kickoff press conference. I've been told that when uh, Roger Moore stopped doing James Bond, and he was asked, is there anything on your list you want to play? He said, yes, the villain in James Bond. So I'm very happy to be in that position now. Bond and Kara have a lovely time swanning around being cultural elites, while Saunders reappears to do some digging into Koskov's finances to see how the hell he could afford to buy Kara such a fancy-ass cello. Meanwhile, the couple offset their highbrow opera going with a trip to the local fun fair. It never ceases <laughs> being odd to me, seeing James Bond riding a dodgem, but I do like the gag that the shooting range guy is exasperated with Bond being the best player in the world at this. No more. All this kind of facilitates Bond and Kara falling for each other, I guess. The Living Daylights is pretty much a one-woman show for Bond, and I think we're supposed to believe that Bond might have stronger feelings for Kara than he does for most Bond girls. I'm not sure if this ever really works for me, though, largely because of Kara herself. Just to go on a bit of an aside here, when I think about the best Bond love stories, I think of Tracy and I think of Vesper, and hey, let's even throw in Tiffany Case from the novel Diamonds Are Forever too. Each of these romances convinced me that Bond had fallen in love, with that woman, and I guess I could buy them as couples more, because there was a certain world weariness to each of the women. I don't think that any of them were presented as an equal to Bond, but there was something about their jaded views of the world and life that made them great partners to him. With Kara, her cow-eyed naivety just wears a bit thin for me after a while, and I guess we're supposed to believe that Bond is falling for her because of this. Uh, she's kind of childlike for most of this, and I guess I prefer my top-tier Bond love interests to just have a bit more spunk in them. Anyway, on with the plot, Bond meets with Saunders again, who has done that digging and found out that it was actually Brad Whittaker who paid for Kara's fancy-ass cello, thus linking the arms dealer with Koskov. Saunders is offed here in one of the most painful sacrificial lamb moments in the entire series, as the agent is assassinated by way of lightning-fast automatic sliding door. I know how ridiculous that all sounds, but trust me, it's really sad. Saunders is one of the best Bond ally characters in the entire series, and again, just from a screenwriting perspective, it's lovely that there's a little arc to his and Bond's relationship. They start out bickering and at odds, but slowly warm to each other. It's subtle, of course, but compared with the last film with the Chuck Lee character, who was basically there to exposit and die, it's nice that they went to the extra effort of giving this character an actual likeable personality and some growth over his scenes. Saunders' death is, of course, the work of Necros, who disguised himself as a balloon seller, and even went to the effort of leaving a balloon marked with smeared spionum at the scene. This prompts a bit of a rage from Bond, and we see him actually make a mistake here. He rushes after the first balloons he sees, which turns out at a fair ground not to be that great an idea, and he ends up terrifying a mother and her son, who I must say I do enjoy watching run away terrified in the background. <laughs> I don't know why, but it just gets a smile out of me every time. It's a nice bit of characterization that Bond is actually sent into a rage and loses his cool for just a moment. I mean, I can't imagine that Roger's Bond would have flown off the handle quite like this, and it gives Dalton's version of the character a nice extra layer of fallibility. He's even quite off with Kara during the next dialogue exchange, and I love Dalton in this scene. It really feels like he's looking into Kara's soul to try to figure out if there's a way that she could actually be double-crossing him herself. The pair head to Tangier next, where Bond seemingly plays right into Koskov's hands by confronting General Pushkin in his hotel room. Again, I think that John Rhys Davies is really great in this part. I think this scene is handled really well, but it would have been all that much more impactful if this had been General Gogol from the previous five films. And hey, they could have even brought back his recurring mistress character, Rubelvich, who appeared in three of the previous films. The character that we actually get in this film is called Rubovich, which leads me to believe that at some point it was intended to be that same character. Character, but when Kogol got changed to Pushkin, Michael G. Wilson did a find and replace jobby on the script. I think that this could have been the ultimate payoff for that recurring character after all of these appearances to have such an integral role in the plot again. Um, but saying that, I am kind of torn because I love John Rhys Davies and I think he does great work here. I wouldn't want him to not be in the film, so. Eh. 
Dalton is terrific here too, and really has the audience on the edge of their seats as to what he's gonna do. He's clearly still hurting from Saunders' death, and very much feels like he could go either way in this situation, and that's impressive. Bond is kind of unsure on who, if anyone, to trust in this situation, though he is eventually won over by Pushkin, who informs Bond that Koskov is wanted by the KGB for misusing state funds. The moment when Bond gets Pushkin down on his knees is just an amazing way to end the scene. He's preparing him for execution and the music is again just perfect, using the melody of the main title theme in such a nice way, really building up the tension. Reese Davies is playing it superbly, he always maintains his composure, even when he's bargaining for his life, but he's still holding it together and it's just terrific. I love, love, love this scene. It's followed by another great scene too, in which we see Pushkin is about to address a conference where he is assassinated by by James Bond before Necros can get his shot in. Obviously, this is all part of a plan hatched between Bond and Pushkin, but it's a nice shocking moment and prompts a great chase across the rooftops of Tangier, which mercifully excised a film sequence in which James Bond used a magic carpet to escape. This is a bit of a famous deleted scene, and it's been included on most home releases of the film in special features, and it's a complete Roger Moore moment and would have felt super out of place, particularly that we don't discover Pushkin is actually not dead until after the chase. It would have been a little comedy set piece at a really inopportune moment, but I guess the fact that it was filmed still speaks to how the filmmakers were still figuring out exactly what tone they were going to try and hit even when they were filming this thing. Bond is picked up by a couple of ladies, and I think we're supposed to think of them as sexy, I'm not quite sure the music cue is very subtle on this point. Turns out the women are actually CIA and take Bond to meet with Felix Leiter, who even the most die-hard of Bond fans might forget makes an appearance in this film. This is the first time we've seen this character since 1973's Live and Let Die, and wow, I mean, why even bother resurrecting the character for such a nothing part? I mean, I, I do kind of like the actor that they cast. John Terry looks a similar age to Dalton, they look like they could be contemporaries, but the part is just written as, a, as an exposition dumper. I mean, maybe the screenwriters expended all their energy on making Saunders a delight and there was no time or effort left for Felix. But whatever, it turns out that the CIA have been investigating Whittaker's goings-on while MI6 have been occupied with Koskov, so the two have a settled down and exchanged some info over some Jim Beam. Bond returns to his hotel, where Kara, true to form, has confounded things by contacting Koskov and giving away the pair's location. She was further convinced to drug Bond's vodka martini after being told that he is actually a KGB agent, using Kara to find Koskov to kill him, and only comes to suspect her mistake when Bond reveals all about Koskov's deceptions and how she was set up to be killed that night that Koskov's defection was staged. No, that's not... that's not true. I... Now, I do quite enjoy that there is some genuine tension and conflict in the Bond-Bond-Girl relationship in this film, and it makes sense because there's so much duplicity um, going on in this story, so it, it makes sense from that perspective, but Kara is just, uh, she's, she has this tendency to just believe whoever the last person was that she spoke to, and she's just so naive that it, it, it does frustrate me a bit. So Bond is knocked unconscious and taken captive to a Soviet airbase in Afghanistan. He is being used as a heart transplant patient so the baddies can use some ice to smuggle diamonds out of the country? Uh, by the way, I love that the case here says handle like eggs on it. I have no idea if this was a standard thing to have on delicate packages in the 80s, but I find it quite amusing anyway. So during this plane journey, we realize that Kara's back on side. I've been such a fool. We both have. More you than me, admittedly, but we can discuss that later. And Koskov reveals his plans to use Bond to buy favour with the Russians by turning him in for Pushkin's murder, and waving away any potential complications regarding his own duplicity by telling his own side that he was on a secret mission from the now-thought-dead Pushkin to destabilise the West? Oh, Jesus, I thought the egg plot in Octopussy was hard to keep up with, but there are so many layers of what characters know and don't know and believe and don't believe in this film. It's kind of hard to keep up with. Um, the plane lands in Afghanistan, which is where we spend a good chunk of the rest of the film. Now, I feel like I've been quite positive about the film so far. But it's really here in Afghanistan where things start to go off a bit of a cliff for me. And I'll do my best to uh, articulate why as we go through. 
Bond and Kara are handed over to the authorities at the airport, Costco finally getting rid of Kara, and to his credit, who can blame him? Whether she's in league with Bond or not, she's a liability to anyone's covert operations. The heroes are taken to a Soviet jail run by this guy, who is just one of those great bit parts that you get in Bond films every now and then, where the performer brings so much more to the role than is written. Like, this jailer is literally in one scene and then out of the film for the rest of it, but he's so memorable for being so violent and awful. <laughs> Didn't tell you to get down. <laughs> I did not tell you to get up! Bond's keyring gadget comes in handy here, and the pair are able to escape after a quick fight made all the more brutal by this jailer guy. He's really terrific in this tiny kind of nothing part. The actor is Ken Sharrock, and as I say, I just think he's really great here. But anyway, the fight is over, and Kara makes it clear that she's no more world-weary or savvy to the predicament she finds herself in than she was at the start of the film. You were fantastic. We're free! Kara, we're inside a Russian airbase in the middle of Afghanistan. Now, I understand that she's written this way, and uh, some people probably find her very charming. I, I, I just wish that she went somewhere as a character, particularly in a screenplay that is kind of, uh, you know, much more concerned with building in character arcs and with the character relationships and all that kind of stuff. I just wish that... I don't feel like she ends the film in a very different place to where she began, like, as a, as a character. And I'm not saying that I want her to become Rambo or anything, I'm not saying that I want her to stick on a bandana and lead the charge into the climax, which she does kind of do in a sort of roundabout way, but I just feel like I would have preferred her to have a bit more savviness by the end of the film. Bond and Kara escape along with a fellow captive, Cameron Shah, played by Art Malik. He's kind of presented as a bit of a jokey character. If you didn't recognise Art Malik, I could imagine that you'd just believe he's here for a quick bit of assist and then a semi-gag towards the end of the scene as he laughs at his once captors. Turns out, though, he's a great ally to make as he's actually a leader in the Afghan Mujahideen and takes Bond and Kara to a nearby settlement. It's the work of the Mujahideen. Mujahideen? No, I said Mujahideen. I think it's pronounced Mujahideen. It's a shame no one told the sound people recording our ADR for consistent pronunciation. Now, watching some of these scenes in the 21st century might prove somewhat jarring for a lot of people given how Western relations went with Afghanistan after the fall of the Soviet Union, but believe it or not, back in the 80s, the Mujahideen weren't seen as the baddies. I mean, kind of, depending on which side you were on. It's very complicated, and I really wish that there was a clear and succinct way me to explain this without dumbing it down too much. Hello there, boys and girls, and welcome to the Ian and Kevin show. Say, Ian, have you ever heard of Jihad? Stop! Hold it! God, okay, all you need to know is that during the 1980s, it was hard for the West to imagine anything worse happening to Afghanistan than a Soviet takeover, so the Mujahideen was supported by the CIA and MI6 to keep the communists out. This, of course, is reflected in some media of the time, Rambo 3 being another 80s movie example of this phenomena, and, uh, yeah, I guess it's just kind of jarring in this day and age. Though I will say the depiction of the Mujahideen in this film is far from sympathetic, and Bond and Kara are privy to some cruelty taking place, but Cameron Shah himself is certainly presented as a decent ally figure, and hey, you know what, I like this actor, I like this character in the context of this film, and he does indeed provide good allyship to Bond in this final chunk of the film, albeit a bit contentiously at first. Meanwhile, we pause for another lovey-dovey scene with Bond and Kara, and uh, look, I know that Kara is something of a fan-favourite Bond girl, but I just get a bit tired of this whole wide-eyed routine. She does get a pretty funny line in here, though. What's that supposed to mean? End of horse. I want to make myself clear though, when I say these things, I'm not slighting on the performance. I think that Mariam Darbo does really well with what she has to work with. I just reach my limit on naivety and I just want her to become just a bit more savvy to what's going on around her. As I say, I think I'm in a minority here. Um, you could even argue that the character is a really well done adaptation of a lot of the kind of women that Fleming would write about in his novels, who were also quite innocent like this, but I just personally don't dig it. Anyway, beautiful shots galore coming up as Dawn appears on a brand new day and Bond and Kara join the Mujahideen on a trip to deliver opium to the Soviets in exchange for the diamonds that Koskov brought over, and Bond does his damn best to sum up the plot as concisely as possible. Before leaving, he arranged for the Russians to buy a large quantity of high-tech weapons. He's using the down payment to buy this opium instead. He can turn a huge profit in days. 
and still provide the Russians with their arms. As far as Bond plots go, I think that this is one of the more complicated ones to follow if you're just trying to watch this thing casually. Like, there is a lot going on all the way through, and there are new elements thrown in towards the end here, like the diamonds and the opium, and they kind of enter into proceedings pretty late, all things considered. I'll be honest that the story was one of the main stumbling blocks for me as a kid when I was getting into Bond watching this film, so this really wasn't one that I turned to all that much in those formative years. These days, though, watching it, I still think that there's maybe a layer too many somewhere in this tangled web of deals and allegiances. There's even another Mujahideen entity called the Snow Leopards brought in at this point, which feels really like an extra detail too much. I guess it's there so that Cameron Shah isn't so directly involved in all the drug trading business, so there's no worry that the audience would think of him as a villain for dealing drugs? I couldn't care less if the Russians die from my bullets or their opium. Oh, well, why didn't you say that it was only Russians that were going to die? We're totally cool with that. Hey, Koskov, we're having a sale on right now. Buy one bag of opium, get another one absolutely free. Bond stows away on a Soviet truck, and after a stern word from Kara, yes, you heard me right, stern, the lass has finally found some gumption, she leads the charge of Cameron Shah's band to attack the Soviet airbase while Bond has hidden a bomb in one of the opium bags. The plan is to blow up the Opium Express airways here, but uh, Bond is rumbled, which is to the great fortune of the pilots, really. I mean, you guys are lucky to get away with this, you know. The film shifts into climax mode as action kicks off at the airbase. It's great fun, lots of explosions and stunts and fighting. It's a great big action sequence, my only really issue with it is that Bond spends most of it trying to get a plane over a wedge rather than actually engaging in the action himself. Now, I really don't mean to diminish how hard it might be to get a huge plane like this over a stopper. I'm sure it's a very difficult feat. Um, the fact that this is his debut Bond adventure, though, and Bond is largely absent from the action is a real shame, particularly as it makes two standout action moments in the film that aren't anything to do with him. But whatever, I mean, what we get is fun. It's a little bit surprising, though, that Bond was kind of over leaving Kara behind until she makes herself known in bafflingly oblivious style. <laughs> I do love, though, that this prompts a mouthing of for f**k's sake from Bond as she fails to understand he's trying to get her to drive around and onto the plane. Yeah, I feel it too, mate. I've been doing much the same for a lot of what she's been doing in this second hour. Now, the film, I think, makes a really odd choice here. So, Koskov and Nekros pursue Bond, and Nekros is able to stow away on the plane. Koskov, meanwhile, pretty much explodes on the runway, and you'd think that this would be the character's end, but no, he somehow survives this experience. And We'll talk about whether or not it was worth keeping him around for the end of the film later on, but yeah, I have no idea how you just get out of this with just a couple of scrapes on you. Shortly after Bond and Kara take off, we have an absolutely fantastic fight sequence with Necros, which starts on board the plane, but eventually, thanks to Kara's best efforts every step of the way to foil Bond's plans, she opens up the back of the plane and it sends the men flying out the back and clinging on for dear life. Genuinely, in the space of about five minutes, Kara provides an astonishing amount of hindrances to Bond's mission. I mean, he would genuinely have been better leaving her behind. I know that Mary Goodnight gets some stick in The Man with the Golden Gun for exasperating Bond situations, but Kara really does take the gold in this sport. But hey, whatever, her incompetence does spark one of the best fight sequences and bit of stunt work in all of Bond. This is incredible stuff. Up there with the Moonraker freefall fight for me, the genuine danger that the stunt people were in performing this, I, the crafting of the sequence, the actors blend really well with the stunt people, the added tension of there still being a bomb aboard the plane, it's sensational. And of course ends with Bond sending Nick Cross to his death and providing some support for Cameron Shah's group by taking out their Soviet pursuers. Bond and Kara eventually have to escape the plane before it crashes, and I love this little sequence too. You could have just had them fly off and land somewhere, but the fact that there is this extra stumbling block that is thrown in just at the end is really nice. It also prompts a really lovely, typically Bondian line from Dalton, which I think he delivers really nicely. I know a great restaurant in Karachi. We can just make dinner. But the film still has some loose ends to tie up, with some mild assistance from some bloke? Who is this? Oh, right, yeah, oh god, yeah, no, it's Felix, isn't it? Right, yeah, I forgot he's in the film. Um, with assistance from Felix, Bond heads into Whittaker's mansion for a showdown with the arms dealer, which is great in theory, and I like Whittaker using his various contraptions as little gadgets, but he's had such little presence in the film, and this is his and Bond's only scene together, so it just feels so detached from the rest of the story. I love a good Bond, Bond villain showdown, but this is really the only time that these two characters actually meet in the film, so as a result, it just feels a bit 
unsatisfying and kind of tacked on. Normally in Bond films, obviously, you have Bond and the villain meet in some kind of civilized uh, capacity and there's some, you know, sparring going on across a, a backgammon table or uh, afternoon tea or what have you, and then that kind of leads up to the big, uh, you know, showdown at the end. I just feel no sense of catharsis with this fight because whilst I do kind of consider Whittaker to be the main villain of the thing, it is kind of Koskov who's been the one misleading Bond and he's the one entangled with Kara and all that, so it feels like that showdown would have been more satisfying. I just don't really know why the big climax of this thing is Bond and Whittaker. However, as I say, I think that Whittaker is a villain with a nice gimmick with all of the war stuff, and he's of course killed when Pushkin makes an entrance, as does Koskov, who tries his best at winning over Pushkin to no avail. Put him on the next plane to Moscow. Oh, thank you, General. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you. In the diplomatic bag. Now, I just want to pause on this for a moment, because I've always considered Koskov to be a Bond villain who gets out of the film alive, and I even included him in a video that I made a little while back on that very subject, uh, Bond villains that lived their films, and I saw some pushback in the comments about my classification of this after Pushkin's diplomatic bag comment is interpreted by some as meaning that Koskov is going to be executed immediately. Perhaps it really does speak to my own naivety that I just took that line as like, oh okay, they're just going to make him uncomfortable for his journey home rather than than, uh, rather than execute him fully. I mean, we don't see it happen on screen, so does it count as a villain's death if we don't actually see it? I mean, can Koskov be both alive and dead at the same time? Schrodinger's Koskov? I'm certainly not making a case for the canonization of 007 Racing, but that game certainly proposes that this villain survived. I mean, he crops up there in that game, and again, while not canon, I assume that the story and characters for that game had to be approved by someone official at Eon. I mean, I don't doubt that that approval might have consisted of a hasty stamp by someone not really paying much mind, but still, it's there in an official product nonetheless. I just don't understand why you'd make a point of having this character survive a scenario which was pretty much their death scene to come back to just presumably die off screen? I mean, or was it just to give the Pushkin character the last word on Koskov? And I mean, would it really have been too much effort for them to just confirm on screen in these final few moments whether or not he was alive or dead by the end of it? What are you doing? Where are you taking me? What about Kara? What do you mean I need to put my back up against this wall? She is a defector too. No, oh, I'm dead! Finale time now, where we see Kara has succeeded in becoming a renowned cellist, being conducted by none other than longtime series composer John Barry in a sweet little cameo, particularly as this ended up being the composer's final Bond film. M and a cameoing General Gogol are there to congratulate Kara before she flees to her dressing room, only to be met by Bond and his keyring finder. It's lucky for Bond that Kara knows to avoid the wolf whistle, knowing her I wouldn't put it past her to mix up the sounds. Bloody hell, and so we come to the end of The Living Daylights, a film for me that has really grown- Oh, um, I, uh, oh. Sorry to do this, old boy. Standard issue tranquilizer dart pen. Uh, oh, uh, uh. Sorry, old man. Section 28, paragraph 5. <laughs> Oh my god, what, 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 what's going on? What are you doing in my flat? Don't worry, you're perfectly fine. I just had to await the arrival of my colleagues here. They were busy with a Bond fan in Edinburgh who said that Goldfinger was overrated, if you can believe it. <laughs> He's suspended from all Bondian activity for six months. Right, well, how's it looking for me? Well, this is exactly why I needed a second opinion. This is my second opinion. Hello. Oh, well that must make you a third opinion then. <laughs> No, I'm John. Anyway, we've had our time to consult, and Calvin, we expected you to conduct this review objectively and professionally. Wait, 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 I, I haven't even done my wrap-up yet. C could you just give me a couple more minutes? Well, it's, um, it's highly unorthodox, but, uh, I think we can allow it. Okay, well, thank you, um... Okay, well... It's honestly not that I dislike The Living Daylights. I really don't dislike it. I have a fun time watching it. It's just that the second hour starts to kind of lull for me, and in a lot of ways it's similar to how I feel about Doctor No. It's not that I dislike it, it's just that it ends up to the lower end of my rankings because, frankly put, there's just so many more other films in this series that I like more. I'll start off this wrap-up by saying, though, that if I've turned around on anything <laughs> over the years regarding this film, then it's Timothy Dalton as James Bond. When I was a kid, I never liked him all that much, but as I've grown older, I've genuinely 
suddenly come to appreciate what he brought to the part a lot. So much so that I'm one of those people who thinks it's an absolute crying shame that we never got a third or fourth Bond film from him. He just really commits to the part, and you can tell that he's really trying to make this character feel like a real human being, a man with a temper and flaws, and the Fleming influences are very apparent in this one. To say he was pretty much parachuted into the film at the last minute, it's remarkable that he gives as polished a performance as he does. So while we're on the good points, I think that John Barry's score is terrific and one of his best, actually. I absolutely adore the first hour or so of the film, and I think that director John Glenn does a phenomenal job at constructing these incredibly suspenseful action sequences that just flow so effortlessly. The whole sniper sequence is Dalton's finest moment as Bond, and all of the Aston Martin action is terrific. I love it so much. I also think that the film is peppered with these wonderful supporting characters who are cast just right and with actors with such fun screen presence presences that they really light up their respective scenes. Saunders, Rasika, and the Jailer are my top three examples of this. Absolutely adore these characters. Where the film starts to lose me is in the second hour. I think that this is one of the more complex plots in the series, and don't get me wrong, I'm happy usually to just let Bond plots wash over me most of the time, but here there are just so many variables in play. I mean, there's arms, there's opium, there's diamonds thrown in randomly at the end, and all of the various layers of deception and double-crossing going on. For me, there's just a layer too many. Kara is a character that I've never really loved. I think her introduction is great, and I think that the actress does a great job with what she's been given. As I said earlier, I don't think this is any fault on her part, but it's more just how the character is written. I just get tired of the naivety, and by the end of the thing, she's pretty much her Mary Goodnight clone and causes nothing but further complications for Bond, and she's just such a huge part of this story and in it through most of the running time. So if, if you don't gel with her and you don't gel with the love story that they're going for, then I feel like you miss out on a huge thrust of the film. I think Necross is a great henchman character, and I think that Koskov has a lot of personality and has some funny moments, but Whitaker feels like this strange extra villain, and I find it odd that we're supposed to think of him as the main villain. Well, I mean, I guess anyway, let me know if you disagree in the comments below. And yet, Koskov is the one who gets the most scenes and most involvement in Bond and Kara's stories, so why isn't the showdown with him as a result of this kind of fumbling on the villain part? The ending is just a bit of a damp squib for me. I also just don't have the nostalgia for this one that I know a lot of Bond fans do. I didn't grow up with it, so I didn't watch it much when I was a kid, so I'm sure its lack of presence in those formative years leaves it a peg below films that, yeah, objectively aren't as good at it, but I watched an awful lot more. I think The Living Daylights is an objectively better film than Moonraker, but I choose to watch Moonraker over this in a heartbeat any day of the week. I appreciate that they were trying to move into new territory, but the film still feels like a bit of a Roger Moore era hangover, and I kind of much prefer it when they push the tone a bit darker with Dalton's next Bond film, where I feel he can really flourish in this role. So, I guess to sum up, when I was a kid, I was annoyed that The Living Daylights wasn't a view to a kill, and now that I'm an adult, I'm annoyed that The Living Daylights isn't licensed to kill. And if it's talk like that that gets me suspended, well, I hand in my resignation. We are not a country club, Calvin. Effective immediately, your license to review is rev- No, but wait! Isn't diversity of opinion one of the main reasons why the Bond fandom is so great? We all hold at least one opinion that might not necessarily gel with the majority, and that's fine. That's part of the fun of fan discussion. I mean, come on, I bet the three of you have unpopular opinions, and you should just let it out. You shouldn't be afraid to talk about it. Even if they're opinions that are gonna raise an eyebrow or two, you should feel empowered to say them nonetheless, as long as you do it in a civil and respectful manner, an exchange of ideas can be a great thing. Come on, get up, let it out. Well, all right. George Lazenby is my favourite Bond. That's the spirit! And I think that Eric Serra's GoldenEye score is actually pretty good! Good for you, sir! And I think that Never Say Never Again should be considered canon! <laughs> so, why do you think Never Say Never Again would be worthy of such an honour? I'm just a really big Sean Connery fan, and it's just great to see him back as James Bond no matter what the capacity. I mean, the From with the video game is my favourite video game of all time, and I mean- This is likely to go on for a little while, so, um, if you want to scroll below and click the subscribe button, that'd be great. Uh, and if you want to stay super up to date on future video uploads that I make on this channel, then please do also consider um, clicking the Mrs. Bell notification button. Also below, there are links to my various social media 
media pages, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and my Patreon page as well if you want to go one extra step in supporting this channel. Also, as ever, please do let me know your own thoughts on this film in the comments section below. I know that this is a really popular one, so please feel free to um, have a go at me where you think that uh, my opinions might not be uh, the greatest, but uh, yeah, please do let me know in the comments section below. And uh, until next time, Bond fans, so there's a variety of reasons really why I think it's as good as it is, and I hope that I've gone some way into explaining uh, part of the reason why I think it is so great. <laughs> Release the bird guano. <gasps>